Hi guys, welcome back. The next topic we're going to study is pulmonary function tests. Here I'll be drawing a couple of flow volume curves before you discuss some mathematical aspects of spirometry and in the end talk about DLCO that is diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide and its applied aspects. So let's get started. The first and the foremost thing I want you to remember is that in spirometry you see inspiration is when you're going up in the curve and when you go down in the curve it is expiration but flow volume curve is opposite it is ulta it is reverse that as you can see in the sketch that I'm now going to make before you inspiration will be present rather inferiorly and expiration superiorly. So I'm going to ask my patient to do some practice breathing and then when he will breathe into the mouthpiece this is the kind of recording that I will get when I will instruct my patient to breathe in as hard as he can my advice would be breathe in as much as you can using all the power of your chest muscles and I'm noticing that my patient is upgrading by filling air in his lung and he's going up from residual volume to total lung capacity. If I just look at the mathematics here, residual volume would be approximately 1.2 liters and TLC will be approximately 6 liters. So if I move like this on the x-axis, I am actually upgrading to the max capacity of air present in the lungs. For a healthy male, about 6 liters is the amount of air that would come in. And now I will be instructing my patient to breathe out as hard as he can. So you can see that this time when the person will tend to breathe out, I've just completed the flow volume curve by here saying that the person has now only residual volume present because obviously the lungs never collapse, there is presence of surfactant, but flow volume curve basically helps you identify obstructive and restrictive lung disorders. And let us now see how would that actually come into shape. You are aware of the fact that asthma is mainly a disease of expiration. You see our diaphragm is so powerful it will be able to fill air into the lungs but when it comes to expiration well these patients will be having a problem that will be reflected like this. I am asking an asthmatic patient during an exacerbation let me say to fill as much air into his lungs as possible so he might be able to upgrade to approximately 6 liter. But when I'm asking him to breathe out, that's where the problem will come and you will notice that this particular part where the curve was actually supposed to go down smoothly will be having a concavity. Therefore, the main message is in an image based question, if he gives you a flow volume curve in which there is a scooped out pattern present, you can see the concavity that is coming up. So this scooped out pattern or this concavity highlights an obstructive airway disorder. It is highlighted or it is significant of prolonged expiration. In fact, I want to highlight this fact that per se when it comes to bronchial asthma, it is mainly a disease of expiration as I highlighted. It is prolonged expiration which you also check as FEV1 which will be obviously lesser than the normal data and now I can even give salbutamol to this guy. If I give 2 pastor salbutamol, ask him to wait outside and then check his flow volume curve once again, you will notice that person will respond to your treatment and once the bronchodilator starts having its effect, the concavity will become relatively lesser and a normal shape would be appearing in this case. So the message is when it comes to flow volume curve, you would rather be able to identify obstructive airway disorders very very easily. But let's look at some other aspects also which he can give in the exam because I personally feel that asthma is one of the easier ones for any doctor to identify. I will first mention the disease. In fact, if I start with the curve and then go to the disease, it will become difficult for you to comprehend. So at the moment, I'm mentioning the disease to you right away. And then subsequently, I will be explaining how the flow volume curve in this person will change. So imagine a person having a big goiter, so big that it is having a retrosternal extension into the chest. When a person of retrosal goiter will take in a deep breath, there would be negative pressure in the chest on inspiration. So there will be a downward movement of the goiter and it will press on the airways. The message is in a patient of retrosal goiter, there will be during inspiration because inspiration will generate negative force. So there would be a compression of the airways. As a result of it, there will be a flattening of the inspiratory part of the curve. However, when this person will expire, and those circumstances the goiter will move up and the pressure on the airways will be relieved. So I will just say the fact that primarily when it comes to retrosternal goiter, where is the problem occurring? The problem is occurring mainly in the phase of inspiration. Earlier I was teaching on asthma, it's a disorder of uh, expiration per se, but now I'm telling that the main problem is in the phase of inspiration. So let me first draw the baseline before you, which will usually be given in the exam. And now for retrosal goiter, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flatten out this curve. And if less air will go in the lungs, obviously less will come out also. 
you can very well see in this case there's a flattening on the inspiratory part so therefore the technical word i want you to remember is that this is an example of once again a obstructive airway disorder but where is the obstruction present is it in the lungs it's not in the lungs no it is coming from the chest so the first word i'm going to squeeze in here is that this flow volume curve is representing a extra thoracic leave a line in between if you're noting it down while i'm saying it before you this is a extra thoracic obstructive airway disease i said obstructive because after all there's a flattening of the curve that tells you there must be some limitation of airflow into the lungs of this patient and now the additional word that i would like to add over this would be that this is an example of a variable obstruction why variable because the problem is occurring only in the phase of inspiration and not in the phase of expiration at the moment the main carry home messages are that i have taught you about two obstructive disorders one is asthma one is going to be retrosal goiter the difference between the two is asthma is primarily a disease of expiration it's a parenchymal disorder whereas retrosal goiter is a extra thoracic cause and it is still compressing the airways limiting the airflow into the lungs causing flattening of mainly the inspiratory part let's do this again i'll give one more line diagram before you so that you will become more comfortable with this this is the baseline report that i have highlighted in most of multiple choice questions they will be giving you a baseline report and then obviously the abnormality now let's look at what's going to be the problem in the next case my patient has undergone a prolonged intubation ideally we should not go in for prolonged intubation that is i mean what i mean by prolonged is any, anything where you keep the person intubated more than 14 days then they can definitely be a problem of uh, tracheal stenosis so that is the reason why when we anticipate a prolonged ventilation in a patient like covid 19 pneumonia or let me say gulen barre syndrome transverse myelitis i mean any condition where there is a diaphragmatic paralysis and you are anticipating rather a long fight any patient if he requires intubation for more than 14 days you should ideally advise and go in for a tracheostomy but in my case unfortunately this did not happen and tracheostenosis has resulted in the person now see what will happen if a person will have tracheostenosis air will not be able to go in and also will not be able to come out properly so i have shown a flattening of the inspiratory part why because stenosis is limiting the air going in the chest and at the same time i am flattening the expiratory part also so if they give you a image based question of a flow volume curve where both the inspiratory and the expiratory part are relatively flattened it means the fact that in this particular case there is definitely again an obstruction present but i am using the word fixed obstruction why i'm saying the word fixed at this point of time is because both during inspiration and expiration during both of them no there is a problem occurring in asthma i said problem was occurring mainly in the phase of expiration variable and if you give bronchodilator it will change even towards normal but in retrosal goiter they will be flattening only the inspiratory part if you have a flattening of both the inspiratory and the expiratory part i'll call it a fixed obstruction this would be a intrathoracic fixed obstruction there is a tracheal stenosis in the person let us now compare this with what will happen if a person is having idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis slash restrictive airway disorder in fact lots of time the examiner would like to use the various subtypes of restrictive lung disease or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or other subtypes that are spoken about so he can write the word ipf ild non specific interstitial pneumonitis cryptogenic organizing pneumonia or usual interstitial pneumonitis i mean these are the descriptions or the terminologies that the examiner would love to use just to bog you down with the terminology but the interpretation is very simple let's look at the baseline curve once again i've highlighted the inspiration and the expiration part this is the normal flow volume curve for any one of us the patient is gonna upgrade from rv to tlc like you can see the arrows i've tried to say that in a normal person you're trying to fill air into your lungs residual volume for you and me is approximately 1.2 liter tlc will be approximately 6 liter but if a person is having restrictive airway disease or restrictive lung disease because of pulmonary fibrosis rv will become lesser and total lung capacity will also become lesser therefore the curve that i will start in this patient i'm just putting uh, some marking here this is left this is right why because confusion ho jata hai. otherwise when i say left versus right so my point at the moment guys is very simple if rv is less than or let me say let me give a number here also rv of the patient is one liter tlc is suppose five liter so i will start the curve a little towards the left of rv why because residual volume is lesser you can see the volume is increasing towards this side towards five liter but it is not reaching the six liter value 
And then when I look at the expiratory part of this particular person, there are two things that you will notice in this representation. Point number one, the curve has been slightly shifted towards the left side. So first and the foremost, I want you to understand is if you get in the exam a curve like this, where you're seeing the normal baseline and a curve that is slightly shifted. There's a shift of the curve that is point number one that is to be remembered. And then if you look at the expiratory component, you will also notice that when I drew the expiratory component, I have always drawn it a little rounded, but this time it is relatively pointed. So that is casually written in the books as beanie cap appearance. I'm not solving the question on the basis of only a beanie cap appearance guys. I am solving the question on the basis of the shift of the curve. You look at the data here, RV is turning out to be lesser and so is the TLC because the lung has relatively become shrunken in size and if less will go in, obviously less will be going out in this person as well. I will now use a different color. In green color, I'm representing what is going to be the representation for asthma. This diagram, you can either take a snapshot or for that matter of fact, rather hand draw with me because if it's going to be an asthmatic, this part will definitely exhibit a very significant concavity. Guys, flow volume curves are so simple that even technicians can interpret it. So you guys are anyway qualified people. For you guys, this is going to be a piece of cake. Here, the green color is representing obstructive airway disorder that is bronchial asthma. The blue marking is representing interstitial lung disease and the red is representing the baseline. And if you just remember this much of information, it's more than sufficient to crack these questions that can be coming. The only thing is he can trouble you with words like intraparenchymal, extraparenchymal, intrathoracic, extrathoracic. But if you just get the basic concept right for the diagrams that are drawn before you, if you just sketch them once, I am very sure that you will be bang on track to identify questions on flow volume curve. Next, I shall be describing regarding some mathematical aspects related to spirometry. Right from the first day into medical school, we start learning about obstructive airway disorder and restrictive airway disorder. So let me just refresh your memory related to what we have already studied regarding these kind of disorders. The prototype disorder that I'll use for obstructive would be either COPD having bullas and blebs or bronchial asthma having a narrowing of the airways. For restrictive, we can take any subtype of interstitial lung disease, whether it be UIP, whether it be non-specific interstitial pneumonitis or even cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. In obstructive airway disorders, simple English would tell you that FEV1 of the person will dramatically be reduced. I mean, normal FEV1 should be more than 80%. In this case, it would be lesser because of bronchospasm. What is going to happen to FEV1 in restrictive airway disorder? You see, there is pulmonary fibrosis. The lung has become relatively smaller, but as such, there is no obstruction present. So what is going to happen to FEV1? FEV1 of the patient will still be reduced. Well surprised. Why guys it is reduced is because if the lung will become smaller, then small lung will be able to push less air out of the lungs. Here I'm not saying any bronchospasm, I'm not saying any airway obstruction, I'm not saying any extrinsic compression on the airways from outside. All I'm saying is if the lung is going to be having less inside, less would definitely be going out. So reason why FEV1 is lesser in asthma is explained by the bronchospasm component. But on the right hand side for restrictive lung disease, guys, the reason why FEV1 is lesser, you need to appreciate that is lesser because it's a smaller lung. Therefore, FEV1 alone cannot differentiate between obstructive or restrictive lung disorder. So what the physiology people did was that they divided the whole thing, the mathematical value of FEV1 by total lung capacity. Now let us see how the mathematical domain will change for both left as well as the right side. Let's look at it from a fresh perspective. On the right hand side, I am saying FEV1 is already lesser, smaller lung. But because there is fibrosis, so total lung capacity will be less than 6 liter. Now, if you look at the mathematics here, numerator is also reduced and the denominator is also reduced. So therefore, there's a possibility that this ratio may be normal or if there's going to be disproportionate reduction of TLC, then the value mathematically can increase also. Well, guys, I am teaching you at the moment a term by the name of timed vital capacity. Timed vital capacity can be normal or significantly increase in a patient of restrictive airway disorder. But when it comes to persons of COPD asthma, see what happens in these patients is a development of air trapping. Because of the air trapping, the residual volume in these patients is increased. The lungs are expanded and the TLC can be more than 6 liter. 
So what is going to happen to time vital capacity on the left hand side guys numerator is going to be lesser due to bronchospasm and denominator is increased because of air trapping here repeat that again the numerator fe1 is lesser because of obstruction the denominator is increased primarily because there is going to be air trapping in this person so the end result is that in this patient the ratio will be reduced in fact the main message the main carry home message from this particular slide is time vital capacity can be used to differentiate obstructive and restrictive airway disorders in a sense that it is reduced in asthma and can be normal to increased in restrictive airway disorder well that is on the examiner that he may not write fev1 divided by tlc he can write fev1 divided by fvc the message is in numerator it should be fev1 in denominator it can be any capacity he can write frc fvc tlc the rule of the game is still the sum same that the ratio will be lesser in obstructive and will be increased in restrictive variety at this juncture since uh, i spoke about residual volume also i think it's very clear that whenever you follow the spirometric curve residual volume cannot be measured by spirometry it is always extrapolated no i mean if i draw a routine curve like i am drawing at the moment you guys can obviously pick up the routine values and i don't think so that you need to draw them you can just listen to me here what i'm saying at the moment from the current sketch that i've drawn is that you definitely can push more air in the lungs that is inspiratory reserve volume would go up to 3.3 liters in a healthy adult male the tidal volume is the normal air going in and out of the lungs that would be half a liter and obviously you need to subtract 150 ml for the dead space the expiratory reserve volume will be to the tune of 1 liter and residual volume well our lungs never become empty would be to the tune of 1.2 liters you can see that run markings everywhere but per se residual volume is still extra polluted so the question simply said i mean everybody knows that residual volume cannot be measured by spirometry but it can be accurately determined by a technique called as body plethysmography when i ask this in a class i obviously get very good answers from physiology like helium dilution method but i have written it after this to highlight that helium dilution method may not be so accurate as a body plethysmography so is the case of a nitrogen washout test as well if they simply ask you what is the best way to identify accurate protection or at, at, at accurate projection of the mathematical value of residual volume your answer is first body plethysmography Now the reason why I made you do this activity or draw this curve is basically because I wanted to follow or highlight some mathematical aspects here. That is total lung capacity, which is that you can add all these parameters from top to bottom. So I will deliberately not show the curve, but from a mental memory, I can obviously remember that if I add all of these parameters from top to bottom, I will be having a total lung capacity. But if I add the top three parameters, inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, and expiratory reserve volume, it will become vital capacity. If I add the top two parameters, that is inspiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume, it will become a uh, inspiratory capacity. Please have a look at the board once again. This is what I'm saying, guys. If you add the top two, it is going to be inspiratory capacity, and the one that I'm marking in green color now, you have added the bottom two parameters. No, if you add the bottom two parameters, then it's going to be called as FRC, functional residual capacity. It is a sum of expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. first and the foremost i want you to be very comfortable with the values that i have said here before because if you are comfortable with the mathematical values that i am writing before that means that you understand this curve that you saw first time in a in a genong or gaitan in the first year in medical school you see nobody will ask you these mathematical values why i am writing them down is just to sensitize you to the fact that if you are okay with these mathematical values that i have written that means that you understand the curve and now comes the main reason why we discussing it see residual volume is A component or two of these formulas. So, if I take up a case of asthma, in asthma there is air trapping. In COPD, that is air trapping. So, residual volume will increase. If in a person of asthma, residual volume will increase. Let me just jot it down before you guys. I said asthma is a disorder of expiration. The end result will be in asthmatic patient, residual volume will be more. So, FRC will also be more. TLC will also be more three parameters that are more in asthma are the ones that I've written here. But I just taught you a few minutes earlier what is going to be reduced in a patient of asthma, guys. Timed vital capacity. I can just uh, refresh your memory by showing you the slide where I highlighted it. No, I just taught you timed vital capacity is reduced in obstructive airway disorder. So in the exam, all he is going to do is make these parameters increase or decrease. The message is in bronchial asthma. Are we 
FRC, TLC are all are increased. Why? Because the mathematics is right here applied. And uh, similarly, we can practice once more. This time I will write data for interstitial lung disease. In interstitial lung disease, because there is pulmonary fibrosis, residual volume will be lesser. If RV is lesser, TLC will also be lesser, FRC will also be lesser. But I just had shown you in my previous slide, time to vital capacity is either going to be normal or can be even increased in cases of interstitial lung disease. My request to use only to write down this data by yourself fast, right? Because in exam, when he'll give you all this increase, decrease, no, it can usually uh, cause errors of judgment and doctors are anyway not very, very good at mathematics. At least I'm not good at mathematics. So that's why I took up biology and I decided to become a, a go into medical field. I did not know that one day I'll be having to study medicine and then teach medicine also. That's a separate issue. But the point is most of these pyrometric parameters are very simple and very straightforward it is just that the orientation of these and the ability to work out the workout faster is what really matters so it's here i would say that it's not only about accuracy it's about speed as well especially when it comes to questions based on spirometric parameters and flow volume curves i have hand drawn them before you if you can just follow them then i think you would definitely be able to increase your strike rates now i'm going to describe a case of a young guy before you who was suffering from low backache for substantially long duration the doctor did a workup and found that he was having HLA-B27 positivity and uh, a definitive evidence of sacroiliitis. So he has been diagnosed as a case of ankylosing spondylitis. The same patient, let me say after 20 years and he has not been following up with the doctor who so has not received any proper treatment can develop a chest wall joint involvement as well. The highlight of ankylosing spondylitis is that in the later part of the illness, you can be having involvement of the joints of the chest wall causing a chest wall stiffness. Now imagine this patient sitting on a chair next to you and I'm asking both of you, you and the person with ankylosing spondylitis and chest wall stiffness to breathe out as hard as they can. Can this person actually breathe out as hard as you? Obviously not. Why? Because there's a stiffness in the chest wall. As a result of it, he will be able to breathe out lesser. And if he breathes less air out of his lungs, then the air remaining behind that is residual volume will increase. So I want you to remember that in ankylosing spondylitis, residual volume is increased. Well, what is the importance? In the MCQs, he will write the word extra pulmonary because the problem is not in the lungs per se. It is the chest wall that is involved. So lots of time you will find MCQs where he will ask you conditions in which residual volume is increased versus conditions in which residual volume is reduced. At the moment, I've just taught you ankylosing spondylitis from the pulmonology perspective is written in the MCQs as extra pulmonary restrictive lung disease. And uh, I have just already sensitized you to the fact that in asthma, residual volume is increased, air trapping, then is COPD due to bullas in the blebs and right now ankylosing spondylitis has also joined the list. Now let us see what conditions will he write in except MCQ for conditions per se where residual volume will be reduced. Well, he'll put up all the conditions of interstitial lung disease like UIP, usual interstitial pneumonitis, non-specific interstitial pneumonitis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So if you just get a hang of this table and especially this terminology, you will be able to solve these kind of questions. I've already told you residual volume is best evaluated with body plethysmography. Here I've just taught you questions in which it can be increased and decreased and lots of this information can be having an overlap from physiology as well. Now I will discuss what is called as alveolar arteriolar gradient. Let me just explain what will be the normal value for you and me and then the abnormalities. You see this P capital A O2 or capital A per se in this case signifies the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. In contrast the small a in this case is representing the partial pressure of oxygen in the capillaries or the blood vessels which are surrounding the alveoli. Uh, the normal alveolar arterial gradient for you and me will be approximately in the range of 5 to 15 millimeters of mercury. I mean, nothing is constant. It's always a range per se. Now I'm going to describe a patient who's suffering from status asthmaticus or the current term is severe acute asthma. So I've shown a substantial, substantial narrowing of the airway due to bronchospasm. I have also shown at the moment blockage of the airways by Kirschman spirals. So the big problem in any patient who's suffering from severe acute asthma, though I'm dramatizing it by writing the old term status asthmaticus would be that because of physical blockage of the airways, air will not be able to go or reach up to the alveoli and carbon dioxide will not be able to come out. 
you are anyway aware of the fact that status asthmaticus is a prototype example of type 2 respiratory failure the highlight of type 2 is that oxygen will obviously be lesser because i'm saying respiratory failure but carbon dioxide is spiking now because in this patient there's a physical obstruction of the airways listen to next part very carefully because there's a physical obstruction of airways if air will not go inside the p capital a o2 value will definitely reduce because there's no air going inside and therefore p small a o2 will also reduce because after all the diffusion has to occur from alveoli into blood vessel if there is no gas going or limited air going to the alveoli then ultimately the gas in the blood vessels per se will also be reduced if both these mathematically reduce by the same amount then this gradient will not change and the gradient will remain normal i just wanted you to be aware of the fact that in type 2 respiratory failure slash status asthmaticus alveolar arterial gradient can be normal also why normal because mathematically speaking if capital a value is reduced and the small a value is also reduced by the same magnitude then ultimately there would be no change happening in the patient so that's the main message that i wanted to remember that in type 2 respiratory failure gradient can be normal whereas if you take up any example of type 1 respiratory failure in those circumstances only the p small a o2 value will be reduced and in fact i can give you an example here as well let us assume this to be representation capital a involves the alveoli surrounding the alveoli will be multiple blood vessels where the gas exchange definitely has to take place and now intervening i am representing let me say pus present or airway inflammation present so as a result of pus present inflammation present in inflammatory infiltrate present the diffusion across this area will definitely be hampered you can see that air is going right up to the alveoli but subsequently the diffusion part is definitely getting hampered so whether you take this to be representation of uh, covid 19 pneumonia or whether you take this as a, a aids positive patient with pneumocystis gyruvesi pneumonia i basically want you to understand that in both of these situations it is the p small a o2 which will be reduced because of the alveolar damage because of the in interstitial space getting involved and therefore the message is that in type 1 respiratory failure there would be a definitive increase in the value of alveolar arterial gradient guys it's purely mathematical that i want you to remember the gradient would be enhanced in type 1 and is normal in type 2 in fact most of the questions will be asking regarding type 2 respiratory failure so this concept has to be understood i will be explaining the same concept once again to you but in a different fashion now this time the parameter that we will discuss is called as dlco diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide once again i have highlighted the alveoli I've shown the blood vessels which would be surrounding it in between is the interstitial space. Now this is the lining of the alveoli per se and I have also here highlighted the lining of the blood vessels. There would be basement membrane, endothelial cells and obviously the gas will have to diffuse across all these anatomical layers. As I highlighted earlier, if you're going to be having pus in this area, then it will act like a barrier. It will interrupt or it will hamper the transportation of gas. So if he says DLCO in a patient will be reduced, then the first input that you need to think in terms is interstitial pneumonia. The best example of interstitial pneumonia as of now I can give is COVID-19 pneumonia or for that matter of fact like the traditional way because in older MCQs is loving to ask regarding an AIDS positive patient with a low CD4 count of 200 or lesser. It is pneumocystis gyruvesi. Now, instead of taking this bluish representation as that of pus, you can take that as that of fibrosis. So, all the examples of interstitial lung disease that I've described, like usual interstitial pneumonitis, non-specific interstitial pneumonitis, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, or just say the word ILD, it would be having fibrosis being the contributor to less diffusion of gas. The third condition having this would be having scarring of the airways. You see in emphysema, the major brunt is borne by respiratory bronchioles. There is formation of blebs, there is formation of bullas. But as the alveolar macrophages will produce elastase, the local damage caused by elastase will cause obviously reactive changes and those reactive changes are what I just said, alveolar scarring. So if the surface area of the alveoli is lesser, then the diffusion will again be hampered. Now, leave a point here for the fourth entry or the fifth entry subsequently and I want you to look at this description once again. In fact, I'll uh, just sketch it once again before you and then we look at the right perspective. I'll just draw a few of them here. I have highlighted the lining of the alveoli per se, the capital A. 
I have highlighted the lining of the blood vessels per se. Now what I'm saying is I have a disorder in which antibodies are attacking the basement membrane. So you can see the basement membrane of the alveoli is getting attacked and the basement membrane of the blood vessels is also getting impacted. So you can see now less anatomical layers will be present. If anatomical layers overall are lesser, then the diffusion process will definitely be increased. So if he says, what are the conditions in which diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide can be increased, then answer would be good pastor syndrome, which will be having antibodies against the basement membrane. And therefore, person can even have bleeding. That is hemoptysis. He can either write the word good pastor syndrome. He can write the word pulmonary hemorrhage syndrome. And you can understand that this would form a all except question. Similarly, if a person is having congestive heart failure, now what is the problem in congestive heart failure? So I'm just representing this in the, I would say six o'clock position. In congestive heart failure, there is congestion in the blood vessels. So compare the size of regular blood vessels around the alveoli with the one that I've sketched now. Because now these blood vessels are congested, they are loaded with blood. If they, there is more blood, there is more hemoglobin. So this hemoglobin will try to get more oxygen. So the point is even congestive heart failure, though the thought processes in congestive heart failure, DLCO should be less. No, that is not the case. The point is because there's a congestion present, there's more volume of blood present, there's more hemoglobin present. It will try to get more oxygen into the system. And therefore this lab report DLCO can be increased in congestive heart failure. The next entry I want to make here is polycythemia. Well, that's relatively easy for you to understand because in polycythemia, overall hemoglobin values are more in the blood vessels Then binding capacity will anyway be increased for all gases and carbon dioxide is obviously notorious to diffuse very fast because it has more affinity for hemoglobin than traditional oxygen. Obviously, the next entry I'm going to say is anemia where hemoglobin is lesser. So binding will be lesser and DLCO will be lesser also. Let me put up a little bit of pressure on you. The question in the exam said a lady with scleroderma having pulmonary artery hypertension. The query before you is a scleroderma patient slash a pulmonary artery hypertension litter. What is going to happen to the DLCO? The logic that you're going to use will be something like this. I've just highlighted a blood vessel here. I've highlighted the endothelial lining. Now what happens in pulmonary artery hypertension guys is the fact that there can be uh, involvement of fibrosis. So what I'm showing here is uh, symbolically fibrosis occurring in the wall. It is additional uh, anatomical load, right? I mean, after all, I've shown fibrosis occurring in the wall of the blood vessel. So this will hamper the transportation of gas. So I think you can very well understand if he ever says the word pulmonary artery hypertension. In fact, that's a very common presentation given for pH in MCQs. That is fibrosis will hamper the diffusion of gas and DLCO will be relatively lesser. So an uh, entry that you need to now make here for reduction of DLCO is pulmonary artery hypertension. That is on the examiner, whether he wants to writes scleroderma for this one he writes eisenmenger syndrome for this high altitude exposure in an individual i mean that is on on the examiner pulse it could be primary pulmonary artery hypertension but the point is that uh, if you just focus on the words that are currently on the slide there is pus present in the interstitial space there is fibrosis in the interstitial space there is alveolar scarring and there's a fibrosis in the wall of the blood vessel all of these will hamper and will cause a reduced dlco in contrast to the conditions where I mentioned an increased DLCO. Obviously, these are aspects are discussed in physiology as well. So you are anyway familiar with them. You're already comfortable with them. But I think that it could be a revision from the physiology domain. In fact, just to test your uh, presence of mind here, can you tell me guys what is going to happen to alveolar arterial gradient in tetralogy of alert? Like you have a baby with pentalogy of alert or tetralogy of alert. Uh, what is going to happen to the alveolar arterial gradient? You see, if you keep a baby of tetralogy of alert in the same room here, like in this room, if a baby of tetralogy of alert is given uh, or is present, then he'll be breathing the same room air as you and me. So the pressure of air going in the alveoli will be same. But because there is a mixing defect in the heart, if there's a mixing, there's a right to left shunt, no? So because of the mixing defect, the P capital A will still remain the same, but P small a will be reduced. The reason for that small a being reduced is the mixing defect in the heart of this patient. Now you can look at the mathematics, capital A value is the same but the small a values are due so the gradient will definitely be increased in an individual so i've given you one more scenario where there is an increase in alveolar arterial gradient one i taught you type one respiratory failure conditions he can write covid 19 pneumonia he can write uh, conditions like spontaneous pneumothorax fat embolism all the condition or list of type one respiratory failure that are discussed in the respiratory failure topic can be put up in the question or you can put a mixing defects like tetralogy of or triology of or pentalogy of 
pilot the logic is small a will get reduced in this so lots of these aspects that i've discussed towards the end here are related to mathematics and if you just get these facts right you would be able to increase your strike rates so thank you so much for your patience and hearing me out guys keep hammering keep learning more facts and you'll come out with a great great result thank you Thank you.